As we come to the end of what has been a focus of the last five weeks, can I just tell you how much I love you and how grateful I am for you and the faithfulness which you have displayed? Today we are going to approach the last topic, which is called to greater things, called to greater things. And in Jeremiah 29, 11, which has been our theme verse, it says, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a glorious future. And I want you to know that I'm so glad that when God makes plans, He always has a glorious future in mind. I'm glad that He's the one that's controlling everything. For these past several weeks, we have had a video that have introduced you to different families that call Grace Assembly this church, and it's kind of been a getting to know you section. And so would you please turn your attention to the screen as we get to know the Fasulo family. We're the Fasulos, and this is our story. I'm John Fasulo. And I'm Yana Fasulo. And uh, we have three kids, uh, two boys and a girl. Jaden is six, Eli is four, and Shiloh is uh, three. So our first time in Grace, um, I actually remember it very well. Um, we were at a pivotal time in our life, and I think we were really looking for um, direction from the Lord. Um, and Pastor Doug was preaching the uh, sermon from his uh, Revelation series. It almost felt like the Lord just came down and like spoke directly into our life through that sermon. And I remember turning around to John and saying to him, you need to find out how we can become members because this feels like it's our home. One of the main reasons why we kept coming back, and um, it was Yana referring to, was our stage in our life right now where we have young kids, um, and you know, the doctrine was phenomenal. But with the kids, it was key, and Pastor Julie was doing a phenomenal job with the kids. You know, um, our oldest, Jaden, you know, he'll sometimes he'll come home and he'll he'll know things from the Bible that we haven't taught him yet, and I'm like, yeah. and that, that's, that's a wonderful thing. I remember the first time that we stepped into church, like you just felt warmth and the people were just so kind and welcoming. And it's funny because it's like a reoccurring theme. We actually just brought one of John's football coaches to an event at Grace. And um, afterwards he called John and was like, I completely see why you guys go there because the people, they really seem like good people. And, you know, a lot of the people at Grace um, have kind of become like our second family. So, I mean, we couldn't be more grateful for them. When I grew up, I grew up in an Assemblies of God church. And I got to see, um, really, the spirit move as a little kid. And I knew what was real. I could see what was real. It never left me. And there's nothing like, like, I'll be driving in the car and I'll put, you know, worship music on for myself. And then I'll, like, look in the rear of the mirror and I see Jaden worshiping, you know. and. I mean, that takes village, I think. Number one priority um, is spreading the gospel, um, the Great Commission. And the new building um, on Western SC Street, I, I'm, I'm excited about its location, its visibility. You know, you got the city of Syracuse. All the data shows that it's really has high needs. It's a suffering city. I'm a public school teacher in a city. I understand the needs and having Grace Assembly so much closer. I feel that it really could meet a lot of need in that spot right there from a city that is suffering. I'm also excited about um, the next gen building. To actually have a building next to it devoted to the youth, I think is very special. I think the potential is through the roof with that. Our, our youth group right now is thriving. Um, you know, as, as far as prognosticating what can happen, who knows, but it could be possibly a hub for the youth of Central New York. Um, so I'm very excited about that, mostly the spreading of the gospel and the proximity and visibility so close to the city. I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I got saved when I was 19 years old. So, you know, I grew up in a really wealthy home and of all those materialistic things, I felt empty. I felt like they just left you wanting more. Um, you invest in all these things that leave you disappointed and, and constantly seeking. 
And when you get to know Christ, you kind of, I feel like for me, I learned that Christ is the only thing that satisfies. You know, like I was able to have peace beyond all understanding. I was able to have joy during like my darkest times. Um, I was able to find being like content in all circumstances. And those are things that I just feel like um, the world doesn't offer. I find my purpose now in serving Christ. We've given to many different causes, you know, but we all we always give to where we're being fed and our, our whole family's being fed at grace, spiritually fed at grace. So so we uh, we really feel it's worthy of our financial um, support. You invest your time and money into all these different things that leave you, you know, empty and wanting more. What better thing is there to invest in than to invest in Jesus? We're the Fasulos, and thank you for listening to our story. How many of you, and, and, and you have to forgive me, today's the first day I've had a voice back all week, and so my enthusiasm may not be reflected in my volume. How many of you have your book with you today? Can you just hold them up? I just want to congratulate you on not losing those. I'm, I am impressed. Since you have your book with you, if you could turn to page 21, you'll notice that the last place for you to begin to write notes is under the heading of Called the Greater Things. Called the Greater Things. Today is a wonderful day of celebration, and we're grateful for everything that God has done. But as we read our theme verse about how God makes plans to give us a hope and a glorious future, I want you to know that I become rather enthusiastic when I think about my future and the plans for my future are being planned by the Creator of the universe. Just let that sink in for just a moment. The creator of the universe has made plans for you, plans for your benefit, and plans for a glorious future. Because the reason I'm enthusiastic is the possibilities and the resources that he brings to this are limitless, beyond whatever I could ask or think. And so his ability to create and resource our future is abundantly greater than our ability to dream our own future. There's a passage of Scripture that I would like to call your attention to in John chapter 14, verse 12. Jesus is stating these words when he says, Verily, verily, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works that I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Let me... Let me restate that for you. Whoever believes in me will do the works I've been doing and even greater things than these because I'm going to the Father. Lord, I pray that as we discuss our glorious future and stepping into your story, that you would unlock our hearts to hear what the Spirit has to say and give us the courage to obey. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that I would like you to write down as point number one in your booklets is you are called to greater things. You are called to greater things. There's a snapshot of an interesting interaction that took place between Jesus and Nathaniel. Nathaniel had never met Jesus personally. And when he does, Jesus walks up to him and out of the blue, he starts speaking to Nathaniel about his life and some of the things that he had done. And Nathaniel steps back and in, and in Verse 49 of John 1, it says, wow, you know, I can't believe the words that have just come out of your mouth. And Nathaniel looks at him and says, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel because no one else could have known these things. In other words, how did you know these things about me? And I don't know how many of you have ever experienced being in a place where somebody had a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom that read your mail. And you are looking at them going, I don't know how you know what you know, or I don't know. I, I have been accused on occasion of having somebody say, did so-and-so tell you my story because you preached to me today about that? And I had no idea. I just know that God knows things that we don't know. 
And as a result of that, Nathanael was standing there, and then Jesus looks at him and says, I know I've astounded you by what I know about you and where you've been, but he says this, You believe this because I told you that I saw you under a fig tree, but you will see greater things than that. What we need to know this morning is that Jesus is always like that. With Jesus, greater things are always ahead of us. With Jesus, greater things are always ahead of us. He has done some great things in our lives by which we were allowed to sing that song, This Is My Story, and and, and there was something about that today. I had to turn around because you sounded like a magnificent choir, maybe because you knew all the verses, but it was just beautiful to hear people with deep meaning sing that song about the fact that God has created a great story in the past, but He is still writing your story today. He knows you well enough where to lead you and how to lead you. So you can move forward by faith, trusting that you are a part of his great big story that God is writing, and he wants to bring it about in your lives and in the lives of others through you. The closer you grow to the Lord, the better it gets. Let me repeat that. The closer you grow to the Lord and the more you come to know Jesus, the better it gets. Because with Jesus, greater things are always ahead of us. Secondly, you are invited into the great big story of God. Before I get into the opportunity that is specifically before us today, I want to zoom way, way back and take a look at the big picture And to do that, we have to go back some 4,000 years to a guy by the name of Abraham. Because in Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 3, it said, And the Lord said to Abram, Leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse and all the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you. I want you to notice that in that Scripture, there are six times that God used the term, I will. I serve an action God, an I will God, who says that if you obey, I will, and then he begins to list things. And he tells Abram these things. He says, here's what I'm going to do. If you obey... I'm going to take you to a new land. If you obey, you're going to become a great nation. If you obey, Abraham, everybody will know your name. And then he says, and I will do something so huge and so massive through you, Abraham, that if you will be part of my story, I'm going to bless the whole world through your story. And then he adds this, which I kind of like. If anybody hinders you, I'm going to curse them. Don't you know that you get to choose which team you're going to be on today? You get to choose to be on the team of God and step into His story where He says, I will for all of those who obey. Or you can choose to reject that and be a part that gets cursed because He said, I will curse those who hinder my plan. So God is on a mission. It's the same mission that he has been on since the beginning of the time. His mission is that he has come to bless the whole world. And here's been what's been going on up to Genesis chapter 12. God made a perfect world. It was perfect in every way. He created human beings, and we were sinless. Then we messed it up. But God didn't leave us in our mess. He is stepping in through the promise of Abraham, and he said, Abraham, because of you, because of your obedience to step into my story, I'm going to go on a big mission, and the mission is that I will bless the world through you, and I will clean up the mess that's been created. And so that's what's going on. God is working through Abraham and his descendants to bring about something that will bless the whole world and help clean up the mess from the perfect world that God had created. Now, for those of you that still carry your Bible as a book, and I think mine's down there on the seat, you'll you'll notice that if you were to grab your book, that you'll notice two-thirds of your Bible is Old Testament, if you're to look at that, the story of the Old Testament. That's, That's most of what is written there for us. 
And in that story, we oftentimes get to the point where we, we don't know how to put that all in place. So let me wrap this up for you in one sentence. I'm going to give you Old Testament theory that's easy to learn. The Old Testament is about a people, Israel. It's about a place, a promised land. And it's about a purpose, to bless the whole world through them. So this isn't just about Abraham, and it's not just about Israel, but it's about the great big story of God who's coming to bless the world. Now, if there's one New Testament passage of Scripture that we probably all know, it would be John 3.16. For God so loved the world that He gave His only and one and only Son that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And honestly... There are those of us New Testament people that believe that this is where the story begins. However old we were when we came to the realization that we needed forgiveness from our sins and and discovered that Jesus Christ alone was the just payment for our sin. And and we all know the story of John 3.16, that God loves me, and because He loves me, He chased me. I was captured by His grace, and now I get to go to heaven. And we live in that part. But the story of redemption is way, way bigger than just our story. The story is bigger than that. The story of redemption means how God set his people free to enjoy life his way. How God set his people free to enjoy life his way. How many of you want to enjoy life? I'm going to ask that again. Some of you must have been writing. How many of you want to enjoy life? That's better. Some of you are afraid to admit it. I want to like life. I I, want to enjoy it. It's okay. We're all looking for ways to enjoy life. And God says, I will show you how to enjoy life. But you have to do things my way. You have to step into my story. Because as long as you're doing things your way, you're going to mess up your story. My way, and you will learn to enjoy life completely and fully. So here's the story of Scripture put into five words. It starts with creation in Genesis 1 and 2. It moves from there into the fall of man, where sin entered the world in Genesis 3. Then Israel, the nation of Israel, is mentioned in what the Old Testament tells us about, and the people of God leading through all of that. Then there are 400 years of silence. Then Jesus is born. It's just about Christmas season, and probably starting next week, you're going to hear a little bit more about that. And this is where the New Testament picks up. And then the church is born in Acts chapter 2. And then we have the rest of the New Testament. And it ends up in Revelation, which teaches us about forever. This is the story of the Bible. And we look at this and we say, where do you and I fit into this great big story of God? Interesting enough, it's not till way down near the end of the church story, the church history. You know what's fascinating about that is, how many of you have ever gone home to discover that your family started a movie night without you? And as you're walking in, you discover that they are far enough in a movie, and it may be one that you've never seen before, that when you sit down and they're enjoying their popcorn, you start asking annoying questions, (laughs) such as, hey, who's that character? Are they good or bad? Uh, who's, Who's that woman? And what's she going to be doing? Where did that person end his story? And about that time, the family looks at you and goes, shh. You'll just have to go back and watch it by yourself later. And and you get this idea that you have missed the story of what is going on. And you don't know what's happening. I, I find it interesting because the church of 2023, for the most part, we are walking in at the end of a movie that's been going on for thousands of years of the story of God. And oftentimes, we try to see where our life fits into this, and and we try to make this about us, and, and life is so hard for many because you're trying to make this story about you, and it's not about you. It's about what God is doing in order to bless the whole world, and He invites you to be a part of that. And when you get in on that, you understand that God is inviting us into this great big story of life. 
And when you understand that part and you enter into his story, life begins to make sense to you. So when you look at the big picture and you see that we come into the story after Jesus is born and we're in the church age, frankly, I believe that we are very, 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 very close to the forever part. As we look around at what's going on, the rapture of the church could take place at any point. We're that close to what I believe is the end of this age and the beginning of the next one. And all this time, God has been moving to bless the world and He's inviting people in on it. And the Bible is full of stories of people who said yes to the invitation to join God's story. And these Bible characters are not perfect. In fact, some of their lives are really messed up and I wouldn't even advise you to use them as role models. But when you look at them, when they came in contact with God's story, they said, I'm going to trade my story for God's story because they had the promise of greater things if they would just enter in. And that's what Abraham did. The guys in the New Testament did. And that's what we at Grace Assembly are doing. We are given a chance today to enter into a new story that God is writing for our future, a glorious future that He has plans for and He has provisions for. And He said, if you will go, I will provide. And then he says, because the whole story is about me as a gift to the world, to bless the whole world. Jesus is the ultimate fulfillment of God's promise to bless the world. So John 3.16 is only significant because of Genesis 12.3. And that verse sets up everything that's happening around us. And then point number three, you can trade lesser things for greater things. You have options today. You can make life about you, your comfort, your things, your stuff, your opinion, your security, your feelings, your job, your relationships, your freedom. But if you choose to do that today, you need to know that you will be living too small of a story because that's not God's plan. As long as you are at the center of every decision, your story will always be about lesser things. God is giving you individually and us corporately the option to join His story and to trade in your lesser desires for His greater things. If you've been with us for the past five weeks, you know that the themes that have taken place each of these weeks, number one, you were created for significance. There's not a one of you sitting here today that God did not specifically plan and have something that He has built into you that He wanted to call out at a key moment of time. He's placed in you qualities and, and giftings that He said, at the right moment, I will call them out of you just like He did to Gideon. The second week we talked about you are called to be in divine partnership. Every one of us stands at moments in our life and recognizes, I can't do this on my own. I don't have what it takes. And the, and the God of heaven says, you're absolutely right, which is why you attach yourself to me. And in divine partnership, I will begin to allow you to understand that there are things that I bring into your life that you can't do on your own. The third week we talked about the climb of faith, climbing up a mountain, sometimes climbing up a mountain, not knowing what we're going to face and not knowing that God's provision is climbing up the other side of the mountain. And it's not till in obedience you get to the top that you run into the provision that God has been bringing along. And he says, don't stop on this climb of faith. Last week we talked about living with eternity in mind. We must know that we were created for this harvest in this time, in our city, for just a moment like this, you are called and created for this harvest. And today, as we wrap this up, you've been invited to join a greater story. You can play a role in a great big story of God. And this is who God wants us to be as His church, to be so in love with Jesus that we cannot be satisfied with lesser things. And here's what he's asking of us, and you can jot this down. Loving Jesus with all your heart and blessing the world with all you've got. Loving Jesus with all your heart and blessing the world with all you've got. Just so you know, as your pastor, Cindy, and I are committed to doing this, as a church, this is who we want to be. We don't always do it perfectly. By the way, we're 
We're a church that's filled with humanity. As a result of that, we have flaws. There will be times when from time to time somebody will offend you and some things will take place. You go, I wish they had done something like that differently. Would you allow grace to rule in your hearts and ask and allow other people to be as imperfect as each of us are ourselves? However, we may not always do things perfectly, but we are serving a perfect God whom we are accountable to. And being a church that is a group of people circled around Jesus, blessing the world together is His desire. You see, if we're, if we're not circled around Jesus, we're not a church. And if we aren't blessing the world together, then we're not a church. It must be both of those together. And this mindset plays out in a thousand decisions that we each have to make. So remember, our goal in this has been equal sacrifice, not equal gifts. Equal sacrifice, not equal gifts. So 100% of us are going to love Jesus with all our heart and bless the world with all we've got. For the last several weeks, you have been praying and you have been asking the Holy Spirit and giving Him permission to leave an impression on your spirit as to what obedience for you looks like in a glorious future. The story continues. Today, the Spirit-led impression becomes the direction for your step of faith. And that spirit-led impression becomes the next step for your obedience. And when you obey, it activates the provision of God in your life and through our church. You see, the world of the generous gets larger and larger, and the world of the stingy gets lesser and lesser. And I want to call us to greater things. So here's the choice for us, Grace Assembly. And I want to go back to the very beginning of Abraham's story so I can connect these dots as we get ready to conclude. When God invites Abraham into his story, what are the two things that God asks Abram to do? He says, leave your country, your people and your father's household, and go. Leave and go. Grace Assembly, God is telling us it's okay for us to leave this building and go to the next one. And as we leave and go, the promises of God are, I will be with you. I will provide for you. I will do all these things if you are willing to leave and go. We are stepping into a bigger story than we ever dreamed that God would write for us. And this is a choice that we have to make to leave our comfort zones behind and launch into a brand new adventure of trust. It's almost Christmas time, and I'm reminded of one of my favorite childhood memories at Christmas. I'm the oldest child in my family. I have two younger sisters, one of them that's three and a half years younger than me, and the other that is seven and a half years younger than me. I think I probably was about 10. Joy was probably six or so, and my youngest sister, Jen, was three when Joy and I had earned enough money in our allowance that we were going to be allowed to go to the Sears store and buy mom and dad a Christmas present. Jennifer was so young that she didn't get an allowance, and so I am certain that we made fun of Jennifer. So Joy and I, you know, when you're gathering your allowance to get a gift for mom, candles were always cheap. I don't know how many years my mom got candles. It was a lot. And she always seemed so appreciative of those. And I remember coming home from Sears, and I probably had candles in my bag. And and as we walked in, Jennifer, this little three-year-old, is standing there, and she was upset that she couldn't go. And I'm certain that we made fun of her. (laughs) you don't have anything to give (laughs) I wasn't perfect I remember on Christmas as we gathered around the tree at that Christmas that there was one really 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 ugly gift underneath the tree it was looked kind of like the size of a wiffle ball 
it was from Jennifer, the three-year-old, to Dad. And I remember as they were handing them out, she picks this gift up before we could give our candles. She walks over to Dad and she hands him this mass of wrapping paper and tape. She probably had used half a roll and it was in multiple layers and she really overtaped it. We could have we could have played basketball with that sucker. And I remember sitting there thinking, when did she get him a gift? And dad begins to I think had to use scissors to find a way in. He begins to unwrap this gift and he's pulling layers and layers and layers and and Jennifer's just standing there so proud of herself. And when he gets down to the gift, we discovered that she had gone into his room into a sock drawer and took a pair of his socks and wrapped them <laughs> to give them to dad as his gift. I hope they were clean. What I will never forget is the look on my dad's face as he received a gift from his three-year-old daughter who was so proud to be able to participate. Joy and I are sitting there going, how can you be so happy? She gave you your own socks. We got candles. They're brand new. Begin to dawn on me, and I've often reflected on this scene, thinking that that picture is an accurate representation of what we do every time we offer a gift to God. You see, we can't offer Him anything that He hasn't already owned. We can't offer Him anything that He hasn't already given to us. The best we can do is give Him back His own socks. And He receives it with joy and gladness. Regardless of how great a stretch this is for you today, the Lord, with His hands open, receives His own treasure back from us. And He says, I'll bless it. I'm grateful for it. And I'm thankful for it. So what will be your God story today? That you were created for more than ever? Or that you settled for lesser things? I'm now going to ask that you would take a hold of those cards that have been sitting on your seat. And that you would take the card out of those. There should be a pen associated with every one of them. And don't fill them out yet. Just, just look at it for a moment. And for those of you that are joining us online, you can participate with us also. If you are on Facebook or YouTube right now, you can head over to the comments section and Pastor Jeff will have a link to the form that you can fill out and make your pledge and that will also give you instructions on how you can participate online with your first fruits gift. You can also find this form for those of you that may not be joining us at this very moment but will later this week. If you go to the website and on the website you will find a glorious future, the story continues icon that you can click on on our webpage and it will give you instructions. For those of you that are here in person, we encourage you to fill out a pledge form that is found on your seat. And in just a moment, I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to ask that you would do that. If you're participating in the First Fruits offering, which I hope all of you are, if you're here today and you're writing a check for that, then we want you to include the check in with your pledge form and put all of that back in the envelope, and then in a little while, we're going to give you instructions on how you can deposit it. For those of you that give online regularly, you can do that in any number of ways. I was on earlier uh, yesterday, and I gave our first fruits offering online so I know that it works but it's there for you would you bow your heads with me for just a moment father we've been leading up to this moment for weeks and your people have been faithful and they've been attentive and they've been prayerful and now I pray that that which you have left on our hearts as an impression would now become reality as we trade in our lesser story 
for your greater story. I'm now going to give you three minutes to take time and to fill out your pledge cards and then I'll give you some instructions. We are at a moment very few people and very few churches get to experience. God is trusting us with this opportunity and we won't let him down. We're going to follow the pattern of 1 Chronicles chapter 29 and I want to just read a portion of it to you. King David said to the whole assembly, My son Solomon, the one whom God has chosen, is young and inexperienced. The task is great because of this palatial structure is not for man, but for the Lord God. And David said, with all of my resources, I have provided for the temple of God, gold, silver, bronze, iron, wood, stones. And then he says, besides in my devotion to the temple of my God, I now give my personal treasures of gold and silver to the temple of my God. And then he asked the question, who is willing to consecrate themselves to the Lord today? And it said, then the leaders of families and officers and the tribes of Israel, the commanders that were in charge of the king's work gave willingly and the people rejoiced at the willing response of their leaders for they had given freely and wholeheartedly to the Lord and David the king rejoiced greatly. Cindy and I as your pastor and as your leaders are going to take the honor of being the first ones to put our pledge and our offering into this box. Following that, we're going to be asking our deacons and our elders and their families to come. And then the ushers are going to instruct you as they dismiss each of you to come by and drop your pledge and offering into our box today. By the way, the service isn't over when you do this. I'm going to ask that you go back and sit down and that we can pray a prayer of dedication over this. And our children are going to be joining us in a moment.
going to invite our children. If they would come, we would like them to come and gather around the altar in the aisles. When we are done praying the dedication prayer over this offering, we're going to let our children go back down. So parents, you will pick them up the way that you normally do. But so much about what is taking place here today is about a glorious future. Some of you that are here today used to be the children here. And so when we see these children come today, we know that what we are doing is investing in them. There will come a time when as accountable adults, they will have to make the decision of what they're going to do with the vision of their future. Should the Lord tarry. And so we wanted to invite our kids to come. Come right on up. I'd like you to spread out all along the, the front here, if you could, please. All along the front, if you could. You can come to this side, too. Everybody wave at mom and dad. As the children finish making their way in, I'm going to also invite our our youth, our students, if you're in college age and younger, would you come and find a place to stand up here as well? Oh, there's still more kids coming, and now there's a crash. Everybody's fine. As they're coming, let me read this to you. Today our church will be forever changed. Generations from now will remember this day as the day the people of God invested in something that would outlive themselves, something that would make an impact in eternity. You don't have to be around Grace Assembly very long to realize that this is a special place. The work of God in our midst has been breathtakingly miraculous, and each person who walks through these doors says something similar. It is warm. It is friendly. It's something difficult to describe happens in our midst as we gather. And in the presence and power of the Holy Spirit, so lavishly and generously pouring Himself out in our midst and in our hearts, never to be the same. We've seen things realized that others can only dream of. We're like a, caught, a kite caught in a hurricane that we are caught in His grace. And along the way we've grown as He sent very special people to be part of our fold. When I started here, it was just Pastor Mark Freeman and I on staff. Then we grew. And we added Pastor Julie Durst. Then we added Pastor Jeff. Then we added a service. Then Mark was called away, and we added Pastor Pablo Vargas. And then recently, Pastor Jacob Fitzmorris. As more and more people made Grace Assembly their church home, we've had to get creative with parking. We sit nice and close, and with each wave of growth, Grace Assembly has had to be flexible and adapt. We've even had to pivot and change course in the next steps, but none of these changes, of course, ever dampened your excitement as the people of God. You kept showing up, waiting to experience His presence and fully engage in His plan. We've had to use every single corner of this building and utilize every fathomable space imaginable. And so we started to dream about what it would look like to be on Main Street and to have more space than we currently do to remove the distraction of sitting like sardines tucked in a corner of our community off the Fay Road spur that is unseen. 
We dreamed of families who were far away from God, hurting and broken, waiting to hear there's a God who loves them from the foundation of the world. And that love is so immense that he launched a rescue plan to win them for himself and then plant them in a church community that will welcome them with open arms. For Grace Assembly is a community of hope, welcoming people home. So we began a journey to make this move. And if you look at what you can see with your human eyes, you see wars and inflation and an unsettling national climate. Yet God continues to speak about His glorious plans for His future that He is creating and what is next. Because He is always creating and always innovating and always doing things in an unexpected way. There have been a few that told us this was never going to work that the timing is bad, that we should be satisfied with what we have going on here, that God is blessing this, just leave it alone, that people are not going to give with inflation the way it is. Why move now? It looks like Jesus is coming soon. This is just a distraction. And I'm not going to lie. There have been times when I've been discouraged, maybe for a day, maybe for a couple of days. But what the pastors and the board of deacons and the board of elders knew and reaffirmed is that This is not the time for Grace Assembly to take cover. This is the time to take ground. What God told Joshua is the same thing that he is telling us. There is yet much land to be possessed. And as we have watched this church respond with overwhelming unity, community, and faith, we realize something. Those naysayers underestimated two really important things. Number one, they have no idea the depth of the heart and courage that the people who make up the body called grace is simply possess. You are loving. You are consistent. You are encouraging. You are accepting. You are the hands and feet of Christ. You understand how to take the authority given you and you war in the heavenlies an enemy that wants to destroy the kingdom of God and watch it fail. But you have said as a church, not on our watch. You lead the way in serving and sacrificing for something bigger than yourselves. You are unified. And where brothers and sisters dwell in unity, blessing is there. And then lastly, they underestimate what our God who parts the waters can do. A God who keeps His promises regardless of what human eyes can see. In Joshua, we watched God's people cross over the Jordan River and we watched their faith and we watched their feet. And as they stepped out in faith, God's presence was there to meet them. And with his prayer, his presence comes his word and his promises and his power and his provision. We know that God is the real architect and builder of this project. And he has promised that he would build his church and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. Would you stand with me as we pray this dedication prayer over this offering that we give to the Lord and the pledges that we have made? And children, you stand here today not just because you're good looking. You stand here today because this is a gift that many of us are handing to you. This is your future. And we are building your church. And one day, one of you may very well stand here as the leader and have to lead your generation to do something for the next. So we trust you. People, we trust you. We trust you. Because God is leading you into a greater and bigger story than you ever dreamed. Father, we extend our hands to this offering. This box contains dreams and faith and vision beyond what we ever dreamed. But Lord, today we put feet to our faith and we step into a river knowing that when we do, you will part the waters, that you will lead us and guide us. Our prayer is that in the name of Jesus, you would enhance and multiply this offering to meet every need that we know of and the needs that we do not yet know of. And any surprises along the way, oh God, we trust that you already know them and that you were at work. We hope sometime this spring to be celebrating in a brand new place, preparing a new brand new place for our children and our youth in the next gen. Lead us and guide us 
as we take these steps of faith, but we dedicate and consecrate this offering to you in the name of Jesus and the people of God in celebration say amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Children, you may go. Adults, you may stay right where you're at until our children can make their way back out. Thank you, students. While you are standing, thank you. Thank you for listening to what the Spirit of the Lord had to say to your heart. Thank you for 100% participation, all of us sacrificed, and we will all receive a reward because God has invited us into a greater story. I'm so thankful for all of you. Cindy and I are so blessed to be able to be the leaders of this wonderful church at such a key moment of time. So, Father, we have given you what we have. Bless the world through this church, we pray. Bless the world through our testimony, for this is my story, and this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day in the Lord today. Thank you.